China is stepping up efforts to contain a new coronavirus outbreak. But people abroad have already been affected. So are these efforts enough? Or is the world witnessing the start of a global epidemic? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. China is reporting people with coronavirus outside the epicenter of the outbreak have now died. This, as health authorities fear around the world, the infection rate could increase during what's usually China's busiest travel period of the year. Hundreds of millions of Chinese are preparing to celebrate the Lunar New Year, although Beijing has canceled all public celebrations. And as the death toll rises, more countries are taking their own precautions. Scott Heidler has more from Beijing. Rushing to catch the last trains before the Lunar New Year, many of these passengers at the Beijing West Railway Station are thinking of the coronavirus. I don't think this virus has been properly controlled. I just came back to China. I read a lot of news on the Internet. I'm not very satisfied with how the government prevented and controlled the disease. I'm very afraid of getting infected. I am really afraid of those people who lived and left Wuhan. But I do hope the situation in Wuhan can be improved soon. And those inside the city of Wuhan are becoming more frustrated because medical supplies are running short and hospitals are short-staffed. Many festivals for the Lunar New Year holiday have been canceled across China. And not just in the central Hubei province, the epicenter of the virus. In a rare move, the government has closed the forbidden city here in Beijing over health concerns related to the coronavirus, something they didn't do some 17 years ago during the SARS crisis. The Chinese government was criticized for the way it handled the SARS virus back in 2003, mainly for its lack of transparency. The World Health Organization has decided not to declare the current outbreak a global health emergency. But there's growing concern over the coming week when the millions of people who have traveled for the holiday return. Again, raising the risk the virus may be spread further by people who are contaminated but have yet to show symptoms. Scott Heidler, Al Jazeera, Beijing. In a moment, we'll bring in our panel, but first, let's speak to Tarek Yasharovich from the World Health Organization in Geneva. Tarek, the WHO said it was too early to consider this outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. Why, uh, well, what are the reasons for that decision and what would have to happen for it to become a global health emergency? Well, as we have uh, said yesterday in a press conference following the meeting, uh, there were different opinions that have been expressed at the meeting of the emergency uh, committee. And Director General of the WHO uh, was very clear uh, when he said that this is clearly an emergency in China uh, and there is a high risk of uh, further spread. Uh, uh, he may reconvene uh, uh, the meeting of the emergency committee uh, at, at a very short notice uh, as, the, as the situation develops further. China has locked down numerous cities in their response so far to this outbreak. What is the WHO's stance on that? And uh, does the WHO believe that that is an appropriate or effective containment measure? Well, the role of WHO is to provide uh, uh, science-based uh, recommendations and opinion to our countries. Uh, every country, obviously, uh, has uh, the right uh, to introduce measures that they think are necessary uh, on their territory. We hope that these measures will be, uh, will be effective and that uh, uh, they will not uh, uh, last very long. It is really important to say that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, what is important when you have an outbreak of a new virus, you, you have to have containment measures and mitigation measures, meaning providing uh, help to those who fall sick and containment basically uh, trying to reduce the risk of a spread. So uh, different measures can be introduced to do that, to try to at least slow down uh, the disease. Uh, what is really important is that health systems are on an alert around the world, uh, as China has already uh, put in place uh, monitoring for sick people, uh, being able to uh, test them and diagnose them, and being able to treat them. 
It is also important to provide a, a, a right uh, information to the population. So when it comes to the measure measures, it's it's really difficult sometimes to strike the balance between the benefit for the population of some containment measures uh, and uh, some social disruption. So I think uh, uh, each country, based on their context, uh, will decide what measures are needed. Since you're speaking about measures, the WHO warned the public not to underestimate the severity of this epidemic. Could you speak to specific measures that people can take uh, to try to protect themselves going forward? Exactly. So I mentioned what health systems should do, what health officials should do. They should be on, on alert. They should raise a, a preparedness levels in the health facilities, being equipped uh, and, and, and be able to provide assistance to those who are sick. Now, for the general public, uh, for the time being, there is still much of unknown about the virus itself. But we know it is a uh, coronavirus, so it is co causing respiratory illness. So we uh, recommend the measures that are always recommended for respiratory illnesses. That is hand hygiene. Uh, that is basically uh, covering mouth when when sneezing and coughing, uh, avoiding contact uh, with a person who is sick with the flu-like symptoms, avoiding contact with the live animals uh, in the market. And really, uh, for people, before they travel, if they are sick, if uh, they should really first go and see their doctors so they can be diagnosed. So really, uh, everyone should try really to help uh, the, the, the health system, because what may happen as well, that a lot of people, because of this outbreak, uh, will rush to the uh, hospitals, uh, uh, even though they, they, they may not have symptoms that are, uh, uh, that are consistent with the respiratory illness symptoms. Tarek, do we know yet the actual extent of human-to-human -human transmission rate? Well, we know that there is a human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, and this is consistent with the coronaviruses in general, uh, as we have seen with SARS, with MERS, uh, and with other coronaviruses. This means uh, that there is a human-to-human -human transmission among close contacts. Uh, so we have no really clear evidence of sustained human-to-human -human transmission, although there are some indications that, that virus, the virus uh, has infected uh, from the infected person to another one, so second generation. But again, so far, we see clusters, but we really have to look at it. We have to look at the data. We are still at the early stage, so we know about coronaviruses in general, but we have to get into the data and try really to understand to understand better. And, and same goes really for the severity of the virus. Uh, some people have mild symptoms, some people have severe symptoms. We still don't know if there are asymptomatic cases. Uh, we have noticed that the majority of people who get sick uh, are older people. And those who eventually died, most of them had underlying health conditions. But again, it's really too early to draw conclusions uh, because uh, we need uh, really to, to, look, to look more. We need to do more testing and more studies to be able to understand. But as we do these studies to mm -hmm. understand the virus, we need to be ready uh, to help those mm -hmm. who will fall sick and make sure that, uh, uh, that all measures are being uh, uh, put in place to reduce the risk. All right, thank you so much for your time, Tarek. We can now speak to our other guests. In Hong Kong, we have Nicholas Thomas. He's an associate professor at City University of Hong Kong and specializes in Asian health security. And in London, we have Natalie McDermott. She is a clinical lecturer at King's College London who researches disease outbreak control. Nicholas, let me start with you. The Chinese government was criticized for how it handled uh, its reaction to the SARS virus in 2003, especially for its lack of transparency. How is China dealing mm -hmm. with this outbreak? And do you believe that they have learned the lessons from the SARS outbreak? I think, thank you. Um, I think that, that we need to uh, sort of break this down a little bit. I think on the technical side with the medical people, this was a very fast response. We found out about the market on the 31st of December. In line with the WHO, Chinese authorities shut down the market on the 1st. On the 7th, the genome was sequenced. On the 8th, it was confirmed as a coronavirus. That's fairly quickly. Um, however, I think that when we look at maybe at the local level, um, measures could have been implemented a lot faster. Um, it's, but at the central level, at least, there's been significant concern and pressure uh, from the Chinese leadership um, that the policies to address these issues, lessons that China has learned since SARS, uh, be taken forward. 
Uh, Natalie, right now in China, there is an unprecedented lockdown of cities uh, going on. Do you believe that this will actually minimize the risk of the virus spreading? Um, so I think that's a difficult question because essentially we've never locked down an entire city before to see how well uh, we can contain an outbreak. Uh, it, it depends on the population that you're dealing with often because the, the primary understanding is that if you lock down a city, you prevent people migration and so you prevent the disease spreading further afield. Now, we already know that um, with this coronavirus outbreak, we have cases in uh, what is 29 different provinces in China already, uh, and we've had cases go overseas. So whether um, quarantining the entire city uh, or several cities is going to achieve much now, I'm not sure. It, it also depends on how compliant the population are willing to be with that. In this context, we do seem to have a population who are being very compliant with what they've been asked to do. But in some circumstances, if you quarantine an entire city, uh, you introduce fear and panic, and sometimes you have people who take things into their own hands, and you might end up creating a situation where you have defiance and rioting, uh, and people trying to escape the city, and that ultimately makes the situation worse. So it really depends on the population you're, you're addressing in that context. Nicholas, is the region capable of handling this effectively? Well, I think I'd agree with Natalie. I think China is trying to um, deal with this as best it can. But to a certain extent, I mean, it's winter in China. There are already different viruses, different flus in circulation. And so people's immune systems are already going to be challenged. Now, as we've seen, we are getting second, and there are reports from the WHO of third-generation transmission, which means we're no longer thinking just about the people who were initially exposed to the infected wildlife. We're thinking about the people that they've infected and then the, people, the next tier, the people that they've infected as well. This is going to make the job of the authorities to actually bring this to a halt uh, that much more difficult, especially because... It is coming up to Chinese New Year as well, and we are looking at hundreds of millions of people about to be going on the move. Um, so beyond Wuhan, beyond the 10 um, shutdown cities, we are going to have a lot of people who do carry the virus who are moving to other parts of China and also beyond China as well. At the moment, we're talking about quarantines on flights out of Wuhan in particular, but we're already finding cases in Shanghai, for example, or in Guangdong, where there are major international transit hubs. And that's going to further challenge not just the Chinese authorities to contain it, but also the regional and international ports as well to deal with this. Natalie, how much does the concern grow if the virus spreads to a poorer country? Let's take Myanmar as an example, a country whose health sector is not as developed, may not be able to respond as quickly. Uh, yeah, so I think that that's probably where the major concerns are, because we're aware that uh, countries that have a very developed and robust health infrastructure are probably able to contain any cases that arrive in their country and identify them very quickly and trace any contacts. And so the likelihood of, of a disease spreading in a country like that is much more limited. But if you take a country that perhaps doesn't have ready access to testing facilities, that perhaps doesn't have the personnel or the infrastructure to implement any kind of screening or monitoring of people who've arrived in the country, um, and also that may have a health infrastructure that's quite limited, with uh, a limited number of health prof uh, professionals, perhaps not even appropriate isolation facilities or equipment, uh, things start to become much more complicated. Uh, and it's likely that in that situation, while this virus may uh, cause disease and may cause problems and spread in a country like that, it's likely actually that it's the overwhelming of the health infrastructure in that country uh, that's going to cause secondary effects, such as people who have other diseases or other illnesses not being able to access treatment because the facilities are overwhelmed by trying to deal mm. with uh, an, a viral disease outbreak. Nicholas, hospitals and medical workers in Wuhan are making uh, urgent appeals for supplies. Uh, the central government has acknowledged the, the severe strain on, on resources, but just how bad is the situation right now? We're seeing videos being uploaded um, through various Chinese social media sites showing very crowded hospitals where people are going along to them, still wearing face masks, of course, but going along complaining of high fevers and other flu-like symptoms. Now, in some cases on the social media sites, these have been corridors that have been jam-packed with people and simply not enough health care, frontline health care um, helpers 
around doctors and nurses. Now, the danger with this, of course, is that most of those people will not actually have the coronavirus. They may have the flu, which makes them more susceptible. But then in being in tight, confined spaces with someone who would have the coronavirus, there's a much greater risk of it spreading into the general population. And as you said, at the same time, the hospitals in Wuhan, in the quarantined cities, simply don't have the resources to deal with this massive influx. And so here's another question for China. How do they get this, all the equipment they need from the rest of the country and indeed from overseas into these affected cities? This is very much a supply and logistics question, which I think the learning curve on this is very steep. And I think what we're seeing here is China really trying to sort of play catch up um, to all the technical infrastructure type issues such as gowns, masks and so on that the people coming into the hospitals need. Natalie, I just want to take a step back for a moment for our viewers so we can help them better understand uh, this topic. Um, could you tell us more about coronaviruses? How rare is it that they transmit from animals to humans? How rare is it they transmit from human to human? So we know now that there's about seven coronaviruses that cause disease in humans. This most recent uh, one from Wuhan is the seventh. Uh, so we've known that there are coronaviruses for quite a long time that can infect humans, and the vast majority of them cause some form of respiratory illness. So we've known also that they can usually spread from human to human by uh, a droplet infection. So when people sneeze and cough and if they're infected and somebody is nearby, they might become infected. Now, that really varies, though, depending on the virus you're talking about. So we know that SARS, which, which was also a coronavirus, was quite infectious. So if people sneezed and coughed, other people became infected as well. Whereas we don't see that as much with the MERS virus, which is a coronavirus that we see circulating uh, in the Middle East for the most part. Uh, and while that sometimes can spread to humans, uh, particularly in hospital settings, we don't see it so much in uh, immediate family members, although it has been reported that that can occur. So they, these coronaviruses can vary in how infectious they are, and they can vary a little bit in the type of disease that they cause as well. Um, how often a virus uh, essentially does a species hop, so from a, an animal host into a human, uh, is, is a good question. We know that there's a number of coronaviruses as well uh, that infect animals that don't at the moment infect humans. Uh, over the last couple of decades, we've seen uh, three coronaviruses essentially do a species hop. So uh, SARS in 2002, 2003, that uh, was found in bats, but originally did the species hop from a civet animal into humans. Uh, and then with MERS, that was around 2012. So that again was found in bats, but it infected camels and, and then did the species hop from camels into humans. Uh, and obviously in this current outbreak, we're still waiting to identify what the animal reservoir is. In the past two decades, several fast-spreading diseases have caused global alarm. Between 2002 and 2003, the highly contagious severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, outbreak in China led to nearly 800 deaths in 17 countries, according to the WHO. That's almost 10 percent of those who became infected. It's thought to have spread from the civet cat to humans. Swine flu, also known as H1N1, quickly spread around the world in 2009. Categorized as a pandemic, it's estimated to have killed between 100,000 and half a million people. The Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, was identified in Saudi Arabia in 2012. It killed more than 850 people, and it's thought to have come from a camel. Nicholas, let me ask you, are the Chinese authorities do, uh, providing enough information about how this disease is spreading? I think what we've seen in the past two weeks in particular, the Chinese CDC has been very proactive in releasing patient data um, as fast as they can on a daily basis. Um, the question, though, is to what extent the frontline doctors actually have the diagnostic testing facilities uh, to correctly identify people who are suffering from the new novel coronavirus. This is an issue that goes along with needing more masks and more gowns, needing more diagnostic facilities and also more technicians who can run the tests. We're seeing very quickly um, the local infrastructure in Wuhan, although it has some very good hospitals, being overwhelmed with the demand being placed on them and the amount of tests that they're actually they're then subsequently having to do. So I think on the one hand, there is a clear line of reporting coming out of the Chinese CDC. 
but the information coming into that at the grassroots level is very much still being, well, it is being overwhelmed um, and there needs to be more streamlining of the procedures. But then this, we're dealing with populations we've never dealt with before under quarantine situations. Um, and so I think this is very much a case of learning as best as you can as you go. Natalie, China's government cabinet has now been appointed control over uh, uh, this crisis. How significant is that? What message does that send to the international community as far as how China is dealing with this versus how they dealt uh, with, with other outbreaks in the past? Yeah, so I think it sends the message that they're taking it very seriously. Uh, I think all of their actions so far have demonstrated how seriously they're taking this. Um, and as Nicola said, we um, <clears throat> have seen them act uh, far more promptly this time than uh, with the SARS outbreak in 2002 and 2003, such that we actually uh, had the sequence of this virus very promptly. And that sequence was released to um, healthcare professionals and researchers around the world very promptly so that they could start developing diagnostic tests in their own countries and they could start looking at the nature of the virus and how it might behave. So this has been very prompt. Mm. I think that the um, nature of quarantining communities and cities, well, that's, uh, that's something that hasn't really been done before. Uh, and I think, as Nicholas said, time will tell as to how effective that is in, in this context. But I don't think that even if it is effective in this context, I don't think we can necessarily extrapolate that to other cultures and other countries necessarily. I think each country needs to make their own decisions about how best to address that, understanding their population and ensuring that they have uh, circulated appropriate disease messaging as well. Nicholas, I saw you nodding along um, to what Natalie was saying. Did you want to jump in? No, I just think that um, we are very much in a, a, a new situation. I think Everyone looks at SARS as the touchstone. It's a coronavirus. It emerged from China. But I think when you look at, for example, the H7N9 outbreak, um, which took place roughly eight years ago, seven years ago in China, there you have an example of when the Chinese authorities were very proactive in engaging the, in engaging the international community. And I think that lesson is perhaps more relevant to what we're seeing today. We've had external experts come in. The central level government and the CDC have been quite proactive in sharing the scientific information. I think the question is very much now getting local authorities um, at the municipal, at the provincial level, and perhaps even lower down at county levels within China to be more responsive to whenever a, a novel threat is identified, to immediately putting in place measures to contain it as well as get information out to the local population. But at the same time, I think that also implies that local populations themselves um, are on a bit of a learning curve as to how to deal with these issues, because undoubtedly they're going to re-arise, uh, given what we've seen in China for the last two decades. Mm. Certainly here in Hong Kong, I mean, I was here in 2003 um, when SARS broke out. There was considerable fear. We had um, streets being very empty. Now, today, what we're seeing are people taking those lessons forward and saying, right, there's an outbreak, we need to wear masks, we need to observe better personal hygiene. And even if they're not sick themselves, they're already wearing masks as a preventative measure. And so I think at a social level, you can see how here in Hong Kong, people have actually taken those lessons on board and are applying them in a way which helps to limit the possible transmission of the disease. All right, we've run out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much to our guests, Nicholas Thomas and Natalie McDermott. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.